to see you today. I, I'm reminded of the scripture that says, when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord, I was glad. Now, when I was a kid, um, that, that would have been for me not the word chosen when my parents brought me to church. It might have been I was mad or I was sad, but my prayer today is that, that your attitude is you're glad to be here, that you just, you're encouraged that God wants to do something in your life. That's my prayer for you today. I have found that the attitude with which you enter a service determines the altitude with which you leave the service. And so I, I'm just, I'm really excited today to share God's word with you. We're going to conclude this short series, um, The People Jesus Chooses. And it's been an in-depth look at the disciples, the people who Jesus chose, the 12 men, to extend his ministry throughout the earth uh, after his, his, he left the earth. And it's been really interesting because we know um, one picture of them is, is what we kind of think we see, but Scripture really tells a much detailed uh, and different story than what we know, and so I, I'm excited to jump into that today. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, who, who painted the Last Supper that is pictured on the screens, um, when he was painting it, he, was un, um, he, he didn't know which way he wanted to go with the technique that he wanted to use for this painting. So he chose an uncommon technique that, at the completion of the painting, proved to be the wrong choice. Immediately, the painting began to deteriorate. And, um, and it was centuries later that there was actually a, a committee that was commissioned to take the painting and restore it. In 1980, this commission was launched, and, and some 20 years later, they completed. And at the announcement of the completion of this restoration, they announced that the masterpiece had been preserved. But they announced also that there was no, almost 0% of the original painting that was left. That, that, that they had preserved what Leonardo had done, but that, that all the original paint was pretty much gone. But what's interesting is that in the lives of these 12 men, you can see the same process that takes place. For instance, in their original state, they are very brash and selfish, unprepared even. But the longer they follow Jesus, the more their original outlooks and attitudes begin to fade. And, and by the time that Jesus commissions them into ministry, they are living masterpieces, an embodiment of what it looks like to follow Jesus and to, to serve Jesus. And, and so today we want to look at some of the lesser known, some of the ones that don't take up as much space. But make no mistake about it, it was not the people that Jesus chose that were remarkable. It was the process that produced the people that was remarkable. Often, if you visit a cathedral, you'll, you'll see these guys as these stained, saintly stained glass windows with shining halos. But that is not the story that Scripture tells. The story that Scripture tells actually is one of people who are unprepared, that they had really no natural talents, no intellectual abilities. They were outsiders at best. If, if I was to sum up the disciples in one word, that word would be unremarkable. That's simply unremarkable. And Jesus himself even said of them that they were slow learners. How would you like for Jesus to call you a slow learner? That, that's the nice way of saying what sometimes we call each other. And, and, and so this, this is this group of people that, that I'm sure at some point in time, Jesus just, you know, if I was Jesus, I would have just had this moment where it's like, guys, we need to repick teams. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've, I've came with a really, really good, my group's just not up to par with the rest. You know, when you look at this idea of them being slow learners, it really is reinforced. For instance, Andrew and Philip, who are from Bethsaida, a small royal, royal fishing village, they, um, they actually, the fact that they were fishermen speaks to that they didn't do well with formal education. They actually left formal education for family trade. James and John, another set of brothers who owned a fishing enterprise, they really struggled to follow Jesus because these two ambitious entrepreneurs constantly were fighting to be first. They were constantly fighting to, to have a promotion and better. They even went to the extent of having their mother appeal to Jesus on their behalf for promotion. Now, let me just say on a side note, and this, is, this part's free. Um, <laughs> some of you got that. Um, some things change in 2,000 years. Some things don't. It has never, ever been a good idea to have your mother call your boss. Okay, it's just, that's just a little tip, you know. 
If you look at Philip, Philip was the administrator of the group. Philip um, controlled the logistics and, and prepared all the supplies. Philip's only mentioned three times in Scripture. In the three times he's mentioned, it's three different times he tells Jesus that something is impossible. Now, that's just, they're slow learners. I mean, if, if we were Jesus, we'd say, guys, let's repick teams. I could imagine on Jesus' face the, the, the look that sometimes my wife has on her face. And, and men, you know this look. It's the look that says, what did I get myself into? You know, now, now this is how this plays out at your house. Man, you, you go and pick up, like, some clothes, and you, you do what with them before you put them on? <laughs> You, you smell them to see if they're any good, and then you're like, oh, that's good enough. You put it on, and this is the look your wife has at you. Really? The, 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 that's, that's what I'm married. This is, Kayla's look says, without her ever sharing a word, if I had only known. I, if, if I'd only known, I, I wouldn't be in this moment. But, but here's the incredible thing. Jesus actually knew. It's not like he, he got this hand dealt to him. Jesus chose these 12 guys. As a matter of fact, Jesus chose them. Because he created them. He, he knew them because he created them. And, and he knew, that means that he knew them in their flaws and failures before they were ever turned out to be the people that we know in legend today. Now, at the core of all of their issues, and these are very, this group of guys is very diverse. At the core of their issue, no matter their background or their outlook or spiritual maturity, they all had to travel the road and cross the bridge of insecurity. If you look at any time they fail or any time their, their attitudes are wrong, it usually traces back to insecurity. You know, insecurity is one of those things that is all-encompassing. There's not a person in this room that's never dealt with, that, that hasn't dealt with insecurity. I remember in junior high, it's like, in junior high, we all know we're insecure because we look weird, we sound weird, we act weird. Many of you smelled weird. And, and so in this moment, in, in junior high, you, you get it. But you think, by the time I get in high school, this will pass away. And, and, and it doesn't. And then you think, well, by the time I'm in college, this, this, this insecurity, that, that's not going to be here. And, 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 and I even thought, you know, well, once I accept Christ, like I've committed my life to Christ, that means I won't have to deal with insecurity anymore. That's just not true, is it? It's not true at all. Uh, the, the fact is, is that the one thing that you and I and these 12 men have in common is, is that in order to get from ordinary to extraordinary, Jesus has to address our insecurities. He has to address those in the deepest part of us because he cannot use people, disciples, you or I, as long as we're crippled by our insecurity. And so today I want to look at a, a couple of the, the, the disciples that are lesser known and, and give you their, their statement of insecurity, the thing that they would have probably said to you. For instance, Nathaniel um, is one of the least known disciples. No, very few people would, would you know, they, they don't know Nathaniel. It doesn't take up much scripture. But in uh, John chapter 1, we find that Nathaniel's statement of insecurity is that I'm skeptical Jesus can make a difference in me. I mean, I'm just skeptical that Jesus can make a difference in me. Look, look at how this works. In verse 45, it says, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found one, Mos the one Moses wrote about in the law, and the one whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now look, look at what Nathaniel says. Nazareth? Can any good come from there? Now, Nath Nathaniel was from Cana, which is not exactly a metropolitan, but, but he, he's from Cana, and, and this is significant because this is the place that Jesus did his very first miracle. He turned water into wine. So, so Nathaniel was not ignorant to Jesus. He's not ignorant to Jesus' his, 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 his miracles. But as soon as someone invites him to follow Jesus, his skepticism comes to the surface very quick. Now here's what I've learned about skepticism is that, number one, it, it, it is the initial response of most people who are not in relationship with Jesus. Most people just don't believe that, that, that Jesus, you know, they're, they're just all the fuss about Jesus. is. It, it just, I'm pretty skeptical about it. But here's what I've also discovered is that it is the most common response, but that it's never about Jesus. Like very few people are skeptical of Jesus' abilities. They're skeptical of self. You see, you don't struggle to have confidence that, that in Jesus. You struggle to have confidence that Jesus can do anything in you. 
And so this is what we're finding in this moment is, is that, that we really just, I, I'm skeptical. Not, it's not about Jesus, it's about me. Can, can he really change me? I, I mean, can, can you think Jesus can actually make so much of a difference that I overcome my issues? I mean, you're saying that I could have a real relationship with God. I, I, I don't know. You know, it, it, what I've found is that this, this skepticism about ourselves that existed in Nathaniel is really built up in two ways. The first way is, is that we view ourselves incorrectly. You, you've heard the term rose-colored glasses. Like, oh, they just wear rose-colored glasses. Let me ask you, does the lenses that you wear distort your view of yourself? I, I, and you say, well, what do you mean? Do you view everything through the lens of hurt that's never healed? And so you don't believe that you can ever have real relationships that, that are productive and, and full of life because you've never healed from that one, and so it's, it's the lens you look at life through? Do, do, do you view the lens that you view your life, do you, is it culture? Like everything you see on television is what you have to live up to. Or, or you look at Facebook as the barometer of everyone else's life that you're trying to obtain. Like, like what's the view? Here, here's how you know that this may be an issue for you. Here's how you know that you may have a distorted view. It's an indicator that, that's very subtle. You're harder on yourself than anyone else is. Like, I, there are other people that believe in you, but you don't believe in yourself. Like, that there are other people who say things about you, and you just refute it. Like, oh, you, you look really nice today. Oh, I, I really don't look nice. I mean, I just, I really, that's nice of you to say, but I know you don't mean that. You know what that tells me? You have, you have the wrong view of yourself. You have an incorrect view. You're skeptical that anything good can come about in your life because of you. You, you see yourself wrong. But it's not only that. that. That's just one half of it. The other thing we live up is that we get our worth from what other people say. I mean, th think about it. If, when someone says something good to you, like good about you, man, you, you're on cloud nine, right? When someone says something cutting to you, does it crumble your world? I mean, if it crumbles your world, you probably have too much worth put up in their words because, I mean, we're all going to run into those trials and those people. But for some people, they, they, put so much, they get so much value out of what people say that you begin to live your life seeking the words of other people. And you'll compromise things that you normally wouldn't compromise just to make sure that that person will say what you need them to say to you. You'll do things you normally wouldn't do. And here's what you also, also have happen. You'll lose your uniqueness that you were created with. You'll become a cheap copy of someone else. It's very dangerous to find your worth in what other people say because if you allow other people's words to define you, then you will find yourself searching your whole life, moving from person to person to try to find worth. And here's the secret of it all. It's a moving target. You'll find yourself after years not being able to measure up, not being able to obtain, and you'll think that the problem is not with them, but it's with you. And, and, and so Nathaniel is very skeptical in this moment that Jesus can do anything in his life. And it picks up here in verse 46, and it says, Philip says to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And, and, and this catches Nathaniel off guard, and he says, how do you know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under a fig tree before Philip ever came to you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now in this moment, Jesus demonstrates one of my favorite traits about him. His ability to ignore our excuses. Like Jesus hears Nathaniel coming up the road and he sees that Nathaniel is skeptical. He, he hears Nathaniel saying, there's no way Jesus can make a difference in me. There's something wrong with me. I've failed too much. I've done too, I'm just not that type of person. He hears the skepticism and he just ignores all of it. So the whole time that Nathaniel is focused on what he sees in himself and what other people say about him, Jesus gets straight to the point and tells Nathaniel, here's what I see and here's what I say about you. Now, th this is first significant because Jesus says, I saw you. 
You know, that, that's significant, isn't it? It's significant because it lets us know that there has never been a day that you have been out of the eyesight of God. Never been a day. And it's significant because God doesn't watch you like a warden watches prisoners waiting for them to mess up. He watches you out of his love for you. Like, like occasionally, I will, in, the, in the hustle and bustle of our house, and the kids are doing this, and, and the TV's blaring, and, and we're just not even in a moment, but I will look and see Kayla cooking, or, or, or she'll be caring for one of the kids, and there's just this pause to where I just fall a little bit more in love with her. It's not that we're talking, it's just I'm watching her. It's the same watch that Jesus has for you. That, that when you think he's nowhere close and you think he, he doesn't even know you exist, he's watching and falling just a little bit more in love with you. But it's significant because Jesus, what Jesus sees determines what Jesus says. Look, look what he says to him. He says, behold an Israelite who there is no deceit in him. He's basically saying, hey, look at that guy. He's pure-hearted. And, and you say, well, Jesus, his heart's filled with skepticism. He's not pure-hearted. But it's significant because Jesus all, doesn't call him from where he's at. He calls him where he knows he will get to. See, he doesn't, he doesn't call Nathaniel by what he is. He calls him by what he's going to become. And, and, and this, this is significant because you should know that Jesus' angle that he views you at is always from your future. It's never from your past. I mean, he never looks at you from the angle of your past. He only looks at you from the angle of your future, meaning that he doesn't see you how you are. He sees you as you're going to become fully alive, as he intended you to be fully fulfilled in the way he created you. That's the way that Jesus sees you, and that's the way that Jesus sees Nathaniel in this moment. And, and, and this is so significant because when you grasp this, when Nathaniel grasped this, all of a sudden you get that it's not the words of someone else that define your life. It is the words of God that define your life. That, that, that the fact is, is that it's not what culture says about you. It's not what other people say about you. It's not what you did. It's what God says about you that matters. His words created you and his words sustain you. When you get that in your life, there's not an insecurity that can mount to knowing how God sees you. And this is life-changing for Nathaniel. You know what this reminds me of is that one conversation with Jesus can transform you. This, this is the only place in Scripture Nathaniel ever has a conversation with Jesus. It's the only place. Yet it transforms him from skeptical to radical. Like Nathaniel comes from not believing God can do anything in him so tradition has that he was such a powerful and passionate preacher of the gospel that the religious leaders of the day said that, that they warned him to stop and he would not stop. So they had people mob him, put him in a bag, and throw him into the sea because he would not stop preaching Jesus. I mean, one conversation, one moment with Jesus takes everyone from skeptical to radical. But that's just his story. If you, you continue on, each one of the disciples had a story. For instance, Matthew. Matthew would have simply said, my past has disabled my future. That, that's what Matthew believed about himself. In, 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 in Luke 5, 27, it says, after this, Jesus went and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi or Matthew. Now, that would, that, the reason those, those names are a little different there is that in Scripture, some of these guys were called by different names, just like, you know, your mom calls you something different than what everybody else calls you, right? And, and when you're in trouble, you hear that name. So this is Matthew and Levi. He's sitting in his tax booth, and Jesus says, follow me, and Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Now, of all the disciples, even though you may assume it's Judas, but of all the disciples, the most despicable disciple, the greatest, most notorious sinner was Matthew. See, Matthew was a tax collector, and tax collectors were people who had bought a tax franchise from the government, and they extorted money from people mostly through force. So Matthew comes knocking on your door, and it's time for the shakedown. 
And the government gets their cut, and he keeps his cut. This is a picture of modern-day mafia. Just without the Italian food. Okay? Now, here's what you get. He's, I mean, to be a Jewish man and be a tax collector was like double dishonor. Because you're not only violating what, what is just a basic human right, you're doing it against your own people. You violated your nation, and you're not even allowed in the synagogue. Matthew wasn't even allowed to come to church. And, 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 and here's the deal. He didn't find a loving group of guys in the disciples. They held the same view of him. You, you see, think with me for a minute. The disciples, each one of them had a role, and yet it was Judas who was chose, chosen to, to, to handle the money. Matthew's an accountant. He knows how to run the books. These guys were so distrusting of Matthew that they said, we'll take a thief over a tax collector. And so even, even in their, their, their nice little family that we assume is so great, there's the 11 and Matthew. And every time they looked at him, don't you think that they didn't sleep with one eye open and watch their, their purses and not trust him? You see, Matthew, like us, he, he didn't plan to end up this way. Nobody plans to end up like that. It just it kind of happens. But I am certain that Matthew felt insecure about his past. And, and, and you and I know what that feels like because all of us have made our fair share of mistakes as a matter of fact, we've taken way more than our fair share. And if you opened a lot of the closets in this room, including mine, you wouldn't find a skeleton. You would find a pile of skeletons. And so it leaves you with the question of, why in the world is Jesus even interested in a person like Matthew? And the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, asked the same thing. And they, they said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. You know what that means? That Jesus intentionally seeks out and is best at people like Matthew. Like that that's the whole reason he came is for people that are like me and people like Matthew that think that they just cannot be forgiven, that their past disables. Because even when we read that, and, and, and I know because I've been there, even when you read that, you sit and you say, yeah, but I mean, I mean can, can Jesus, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you just don't know what I've done. We keep making it about what we've done. And, and, and we, we, we honestly, it's, it, this is how, we, the, the, the question only boils down to this. Can Jesus forgive me? The key phrase in that is me. Like we believe Jesus forgives, but to forgive me it would take a, an extra large, supersized load of forgiveness, Jesus. Can you handle that much forgiveness? There's this verse I want you to read. Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now when you read that initially, you're just acting like, okay, is the writer just being poetic? Like, like what, in that language, it's like, you know, is he just being poetic? Because, I mean, he could have just said, like, as far as the other room is to your living room, Jesus takes away the sin. I mean, or, you know, Jesus moves it to another county. You know, he, he even, I mean, they didn't really know about the rest of the world, but Jesus moves it to another continent. He says, as far as the east is from the west, which is, to my understanding, pretty far, he removes them. You know why he does that? Why the Holy Spirit inspired somebody to write that? For people like Matthew. For people who have a question of, can Jesus, forgive me. Because when I say me, I'm talking about a load of forgiveness is needed. And you know what? What the Holy Spirit just wanted to do is, is, is teach those people with that question. That it is not the amount of the sin that matters, but it is the greatness of the Savior that matters.
He, he just wanted people to grasp that you're looking at it wrong. It's not the size of the sin. It's the size of the Savior that matters. There is not a thing that you've done that even challenges the grace of God. There is not a label that he cannot love, a habit he cannot heal. There is not a sin he cannot forgive. There is nothing in you that is greater than the mercy that is in him. And he just wants to make sure that Matthew gets that. You know what's incredible about Matthew is, is that it, when he grasps that there's nothing that challenges the grace of God, it transforms his life. I mean, he goes from this guy who, who, who believes that he doesn't even have a future to writing the gospel that bears his name. When you read scripture, you, you read from the very pen of Matthew. And here's what's incredible. There is more said in the Gospel of Matthew about forgiveness than the other three Gospels combined. Because he knew that there would be people who needed to know, can Jesus forgive me? The last one, probably the one that we're, we're all more interested in than anyone else is, is Judas. I mean, Judas is, we love a good villain. And, and so, we, we, you know, there's so much interest in Judas. Why did he do what he did? Judas's statement would be this, I need a plan B. I want to explain that to you. See, in, 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 when we start to read about Judas in Matthew 26, 14, it says, One of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to betray him, which is Jesus. Now, Judas' name comes from the root word Judah, which means God leads. You know what Judas' parents hoped in naming him that? That God would lead him every day of his life. His name, uh, Iscariot, comes from the, the region that he's from. He's the only disciple to not come from Galilee. And, 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 and here's what we have to grasp is that many people have speculated as to why Judas did what he did. What was his motive? Some people say it's because he's greedy, because he was a thief. I think that that would make him greedy and dumb because 30 pieces of silver was only one week's wage. So if it was because of money, I mean, he, he didn't have much foresight. I don't, I don't think it was about money. Some people say he was a spy, some theories even say that he was a terrorist planted by the religious leaders in Jesus' movement. Don't think for a minute that Jesus didn't choose Judas. No one else chose Judas. Jesus chose him. Here's really the motive behind Judas betraying Christ. Judas simply could not fully trust Jesus. He couldn't fully trust Jesus. So what do you mean? Well, see... At this moment in history that this betrayal takes place, the, the, the tension between the Jews and Jesus and, and the Romans is escalating. See, Jesus has predicted his death. The Jews definitely want, the Jewish religious leaders definitely want Jesus to die. And Rome is executing insurrectionists daily. Records from the Roman government at this point in time in history point to that, 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 that literally every day the hill of Calvary would have been covered with crosses. And, and here's what I need to give you a little context. It's not on a hill far away. See, the, the whole hill is in the middle of the city. And it's not some three district crosses up on a hill. It's hundreds of crosses on a hill. And it's not up on this tall, and we, you know, we, we kind of look up to it. The, the cross was built so that you could see roughly eye level with the person hanging on it, and they were hung on streets to ensure that you were deterred from doing whatever that person did. And so as the disciples come in and move about the city, it is a constant reminder to them of where their destination will be. Every time they passed a cross, and felt the tension between all these groups rising, they knew that Jesus was heading to a cross, and they knew that they would be brought in with him to go to the same cross. And so Judas gets to the place where he has to, he just simply has to build some security. He's got to build a plan B. 
And so he goes to them, and I mean, this is, if you saw the Bible how it really is, this is like out of your favorite crime drama. He goes to the authorities and says, I want a deal. Cut me a deal. I need this much money, and I need immunity, and I'll turn them over to you. I'll turn on them. And so he goes to them, and they say, here's your price, and you've got immunity. And he looks for an opportunity to betray Jesus and turn on his, his brothers. It's in this moment that Judas realizes the plane's going down. And I better take the only parachute. The problem is, is as soon as he jumps out of the plane, he quickly realizes that his effort to save his life ensures he loses his life. You see, Judas is not some awful, awful villain. You and I are more like Judas than we may be the rest of these. Because we live our lives with a lot of plan B's. You see, when, when, when I look at Judas, there, there are just these two things that come to my mind very quickly that are warnings for me. They may be warnings for you. The first one is this. Proximity to Jesus does not guarantee knowing Jesus. Judas heard every message Jesus ever preached. Judas had personal appeals multiple times from Christ that said, Judas, give up your plan B. Judas, don't, don't, don't I, I, put down your security. Don't do it, Judas. Even to the fact that we had discovered last week, Jesus got down on his knees and washed Judas' feet to keep him from doing what he was going to do. Judas had every opportunity to turn. Proximity to Jesus does not guarantee knowing Jesus. I can be near the church. I can sing the songs. And I can be as far from Jesus as someone who's never stepped foot in the building. My heart can be as far from Jesus as anyone else who's never uttered his name. How close you are to the church and to what appears to be Jesus does not guarantee that you know Jesus. But the second thing that, that is such a reality check for me is that plan B's never work. They just never work. You see, if we're honest, we all live with some duality in our lives. I mean, we say we believe Jesus. We follow Jesus. Jesus, I'm with you. You're plan A. But just in case it gets tough, Jesus, I got plan B in my back pocket. You know this is true. Think about your marriage. You've told people, we're going to trust God. We're going to get through this. You've told yourself, we're going we're to live. I'm going to submit. I'm going to love. We're going to do the right thing. And the whole time you're doing that, you've also explored what divorce papers, what you need to pull together to get that done. Jesus, you're plan A, but just in case this doesn't work out, I got plan B in the drawer. Th think about it in your finances. Like, Jesus, your plan A, the way you say to handle debt, that's the way we handle it. Jesus, when you say give, that's what I, Jesus, the way you say to handle money, your plan A. Until it gets a little tight. And then all of a sudden, the commitment you made gets pulled off the table and plan B gets put back up on the table. Or, or maybe it's anxiety for you. There are some people in here that you, you, people come to you in your office and tell you, I'm just not going to make it. And you say, you're going to make it. You're going to do it. God's going to help you. I mean, you got wallpaper of Romans 8.28 on your wall. And the moment that you don't feel immediate peace, you run back to the habit that's destroying your life. Plan B. Jesus, we're following you. Plan A. But just in case, plan B. Now, here's what's very concerning about this is that at its core, this is about faith. Is God who he says he is, and will he do what he says he will do? But also what is interesting is that Jesus never engages Judas in this game. Jesus doesn't say, okay, Judas, you can keep your plan B. Let's hope everybody else follows me all the way. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. And here's what's concerning is that a plan B ensures that you don't live in faith. And without faith, there is no relationship with Jesus. And without a relationship with Jesus, there's only death. 
And, 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 you know, there's just this moment where I wonder if Judas remembered this teaching from Jesus. Mark 8, 35, where he, Jesus was teaching and he said, If you try to hang onto your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. I mean, think about it. I mean, I just don't think it's coincidence that the Holy Spirit inspired the word hang in there. I, I mean, when you read that, you just, you just, it makes me want to ask you, what is your plan B? What's the thing that you, you're not trusting God with? I mean, you may th- make other people think that you're trusting God, but I mean, what's the thing that at its core, you've got plan B stuck in the drawer? You've got plan B stuck in your back pocket. What's the thing that, that we say is Lord of all, but the truth is there is a part of my life that he's not Lord of and that, that I, I, I'm going to handle that, a plan B. I, I just can't fully trust Jesus. I only ask because it is so important that you know that if you choose to hang on to that, it will eventually hang you like it did Judas. I only ask because if you really want the marriage that God has for you, you can't dually be thinking about what it looks like to leave that marriage. Jesus is not going to bless something that you're half-heartedly into. Even if you feel like you've given your all, if there's a plan B on the table, there's a part of you that hasn't been given yet. You can't, I only ask because you will not and should not expect financial favor in your life as long as you withhold that part of your life from Jesus. God doesn't bless outside of his boundaries. I only ask because you will never live to the fullest of what you were designed to live. You will never be extraordinary. You will never know the intimacy of of, of trusting God. You will never fully grasp who you could become in him as long as you cling on to your plan and his. Jesus has to be fully trusted. Because if he's not fully trusted, it ends in death. Your attempt to secure your life ensures its destruction. You know, this really is the story of the disciples. The story of the disciples is this. That a life fully devoted to Christ becomes extraordinary. That ordinary people become the most extraordinary people that have ever lived, that 2,000 years will still talk about them only if their lives are fully trusting of Christ. I, I mean, when you look at these guys, you just you have to know the, their false story. James, for instance, we talked about James. James is this ordinary fisherman who at the end of his life is so transformed by Jesus that his preaching unnerves a king. Like, we're talking about a king with a kingdom, not like he's bugging his neighbor. And this king becomes so unnerved by James' preaching that he sends soldiers to murder him. Someone who was literally in the middle of nowhere with no talent, no calling, is transformed by Jesus and moves the hands of kings with their passionate preaching. Andrew... Andrew is the younger brother of Peter who sits in the background his whole life. He takes the gospel to to near Russia and is so gaining influence when he's not even a natural leader, gaining influence that that, that, that a, a czar of that area has him put to death. And to punish him extra, he has him crucified. But not on a typical T, but on an X. Now here's what you should know is that On a T, a person would last about six hours. On an X, Andrew lasted three days. But that's not the most compelling part. Tradition says that Andrew, while hanging on the cross, that he preached to anyone who walked by the cross. What takes somebody from so ordinary to so extraordinary? The story of the disciples is not a story about them. It is a story about Jesus in them. And it's the same story that God wants to tell with your life, that you're from nowhere and nobody knows you and you really don't have that much to give. But with Jesus, you can become extraordinary and do impeccable things for his kingdom. 
It's the story he wants to tell. By the way, it's the story of how you deal with insecurity. You see, if you deal with insecurity today, you focus on your inadequacies constantly. And you're never going to have any peace or joy or significance while you're focusing on your inadequacies. You only have those things when you focus on Christ's sufficiencies. So if you'll stop looking at your inadequacies like these 12 men did, and you focus on Christ's sufficiencies, your life will move from ordinary to extraordinary. Stand to your feet. I want to pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. There are people in this room at this moment who want and need to follow Jesus. You may be someone who's been skeptical that Jesus can make any difference like Nathaniel. You may be someone who's, who, who just, honestly, you, you just can't believe that God could forgive what you've done. Or maybe you're here today and you, you just, you've had a plan B the whole time. And you've never really followed Jesus. You just have the appearance of that. Regardless of what your situation is, if today, if you sense God speaking to you, if you sense him drawing you, that you want to be in relationship with him and you want to follow him, I want you to lift your hand in the air as a signifying uh, of confession that I want that. I'm going to pray with you. I see hands on the floor. I'm waiting on you. I see hands on the floor, more hands, very in the balcony, hands on the floor over here. There are people making eternal decisions at this moment. They want to follow Jesus. They want to fully trust Jesus. At this moment, while everyone else is praying, there is a prayer on the screen that will help you pray with me. And it simply takes you through a scriptural acceptance of Jesus, of of deciding to follow Jesus. Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner and I am lost without you. I believe Christ died in my place, making a way for us to have a relationship. I choose to follow Jesus and His way for the rest of my life. And if you believe that by faith, that Jesus is in, having a relationship with you, wants to be in a relationship, He loves you, I'm going to pray that all peace and joy and love flood your life. And we all say together, Amen. Amen. Now, it's very important if you raised your hand today and you prayed that prayer. As a church, it is our job not to hinder you, but to help you. That's what our role is, is to help you grow that relationship with Jesus. The moment you just had is not the end, it's the beginning. And and so we want to help you grow that relationship. In front of you, there is a card that says prayer card. And on that, there is a box that you can check that helps us know about the decision you made. It is very important that you, you, you fill that out, leave it in your seat, or drop it at Connect Central. Once again, you can leave that in your seat or drop it at Connect Central because we as a church want to help you. We're not going to hassle you. We're not going to hinder you. We're going to help you grow that relationship with Jesus. If we need to get you a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. If we need to help you get around some people that can help explain it to you, we're going to do that. We're going to encourage you. We're here to serve you. But we can only do that if we know you. So take the time to fill that card out. Let me tell you, that card doesn't make anything official. You ain't buying a car today, okay? It's just, this is about us helping you. What God's done in your life is absolute and cannot be undone in you today. Now, for the rest of us today, here's what my prayer is. And I want to pray with you. I want to pray that God will give you the greatest measure of faith that you have ever had. Because there are people here, all of us, to have plan B stuck in drawers and file cabinets and pockets. And I mean, we got them everywhere. And the thing is, we're never going to be who God's called us to be and know Christ at the level that He wants to know us as long as we've got all these plan Bs in our life. And so here's what I want to pray is just a full measure of faith, that we would be a group of people that, that believe there's nothing impossible to those who believe. And so just as a, as, as a symbol of, of saying, God, I want all you've got for me, I just want, want you to stick your hands up. 
and I'm going to pray over you right now. You're just, you're just saying, God, I just want this much. As much as you got, I want, it, I want it. Father, I pray for a gift of faith to raise up in your people. I pray that, that, Lord, literally, they would believe that blinded eyes could be opened and that cancer has no place in your kingdom, that they would believe that you can turn around any situation, no matter how dire it is. I pray, God, they would trust you fuller, know you closer. I pray, God, that they would put away plan Bs, things that they think they've got to hold on to in the name of Jesus, just give them the strength to get rid of them. Lord, I pray that you'd convict us and out of unbelief and help our unbelief today. Just strengthen us today, Father, and make us into people who, Father, are not extraordinary, but know an extraordinary Savior. Do such a work in us, God, that people cannot help but notice the faith that is in our lives, that we truly would believe that there's nothing impossible for you, oh God. Make us those people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen, amen. Bless the Lord today. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message was an encouragement to you to live a life fully devoted to God. For more information about Twin Rivers Worship Center, or if you would like to partner with this church's ministry in St. Louis, Missouri and around the world by giving, visit us at our website at trwc.com. We would love for you to join us in a worship service at one of our two locations sometime. Have a great day and be blessed.